All right, everybody. So a good friend of mine up in Canada had a bunch of swords made by, for him by the art of iron and fire. I haven't seen them. I cut it open a little bit to make it a little quicker <laughs> for this sort of live unboxing here. Um, and he wanted me to have a look at them and say how they compared with antique blades, you know, as a point of balance, etc. historically accurate. So we're going to find that out. Hopefully I can get this box open without too much trouble. Uh, the boxes they have from China, they ship from China, often really, they put enough tape on them that they uh, can withstand a nuclear explosion, I think. A lot of times I find a good old pair of scissors works better, we'll see. But it's really a lot of tape on there, which is good, I guess. They stay dry and they make it here in one piece. All right. <laughs> So there's three in here. I think I try to turn this over and slide them out. Well, let's see. Okay. I'm gonna put them back in and ship them on. There's two out. Oop, do that well, dropping them over. Okay. All right, so that's two. Let's take a look at these two first since they came out of the box. So, okay, nice boxes. So one of the things that's nice in China these days, pretty much all the makers give you a, a nice storage box. Um, you know, they're not, they're just cardboard. They're not something super fancy, but that's a nice thing to have for, you know, just in general, I like that. And let's see, got some foam blocks in here. You know, that's a nice little thing. They, Included some uh, white gloves, so if you're going out to dinner, <laughs> or but also for handling your swords, obviously that those are good. And what's this? Ah, belt hook. I'm probably not going to unwrap that. Let's see. And other nice thing. I guess get this box out of the way, John. If you would take that, please. All right, so. Uh, another nice thing that's pretty, I think pretty near all the forges are doing these days, which is, I mean, it's not a necessary thing, but it's a nice little thing, is to give you these sword bags. That's really convenient. Uh, if you've got a lot of swords and they're stacking up in the, you know, in the corner or something, that prevents them from scratching each other. And this is where scissors come in handy again. Uh, scissors, I find, is a little better than a knife because you're, it's easy enough to poke yourself and draw blood as it is. Unpacking these things sometimes. They get so taped up. That scissors a little bit better, a little less likely to slice yourself or damage your new sword. Just poke it under there and cut through there. And one more, hopefully I can get it off. I did see pictures of these before they were sent. They looked good. Okay, blackened fittings. That's nice. That's good because you don't have to worry about the upkeep as much. Okay, and black it off of there. No, I need to cut that open. You know, it's nice to have a look at somebody else's swords. Uh, but now I have to repack them all. <laughs> repack the rack. To repack it all, to send it out to them. But it is good because I also, people often ask me about a company. And I haven't, you know, I can't say I've handled every single product of every single company. So it's nice to be able to see these things. All right, so, so far it's looking really good. Again, this, as I mentioned earlier, this is. Art of Iron and Fire. They seem to be pretty good forge. None of them are forges I'd say are really perfect these days, to be honest, but this forge seems to really be doing a good job as far as historical accuracy and quality goes. Okay, so there you are. That's the first one. Looks pretty nice. I like this. Is the other thing that companies have started doing lately is good, is adding that little sword tassel there, which is good. That's used. You put your hand through it. This one seems a little bit tight. Oh, no, it's okay. That's done like this, so in use. If you drop your sword in combat, you don't lose it. So, oops, that's a nice little thing. I'm glad to see people are doing that. Fittings here, probably gonna be hard to see it with this dark finish, but 
They have uh, a little reflection on there. They have very nice traditional designs. But I know what we really want to know is what's the blade like. Now, this is a new sword. Scabbard should be clean, but who knows? I mean, this came from a, you know, forges. Forges are very dirty places, and so there could be grit around. So you never want to pull it, especially if it's not your sword, flat like this either way. If it's a saber, do it on its back. And I'm going to push, it's a little bit tight at first, push it away rather than pull it toward you because this is sharp. I don't want to pull it toward it. And, you know, if you have a, 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 a dual, a scar from dueling, that's pretty cool. If you have a scar from cutting yourself, that's not cool. <laughs> so, so don't do that. Uh, this is one thing a lot of them do today too that I wish they didn't do, which is put lots of plastic on it. That's just bad for the environment. Okay, so this is really quite nice. Um, you get a good perspective on it there. Uh, really nice, and I'd say right on. Yep. Weight and balance and everything, I say this is really right on. Uh, John, would you hand me that white cloth there? I'll just wipe off some of the packing grease here. That one, that's good, yeah. Thank you. And so just wipe it down. Let's see. Well, it's, it's fairly sharp. I would say it's actually sharper than you need to be. Um, swords were not always as sharp as people tend to think. Fullers look nice and clean and well cut. That's always a good sign. If somebody can do the fullers well, usually the other skills are good because that's very time consuming and you have to, have to know what you're doing. Uh, and this one, I hope I can get a light on it just right, is horse tooth pattern. I think really pick it up. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, you can see it here. It's horse tooth pattern, which is really nice. Can you see those little undulations in the blade? Right? I know it's hard to get the light just right on it. And that is uh, uh, the reason you do that rather than having a straight horse tooth edge is because while you always want to be deflecting with a flattier blade, and this is actually why we got this horse tooth pattern here, but it's really quite a nice horse tooth pattern. Um, Chinese blades are made, Japanese are also same, same, Japanese swords were made by a method they picked up from China. They have a, a three-plate construction, and that central plate is really very, very hard, high-carbon steel, which means it cuts very well, holds its edge well, but is also, relatively speaking, very brittle. It's also the thinnest part of the blade, so it's the most fragile part of the blade. So hard means also tends to be brittle. And so that's why we don't edge on edge, because you'll crack the blade and it, it will break. It might break that moment, it might break down the line somewhere, but nobody should be using their blade in a way that is going to you know, knowingly destroy it. I understand in European practices it's different, but blade construction is different. In Chinese arts, this is one of the, one of the main reasons, as well as reasons of technique and flow and so on. We don't edge on edge is because those are the two hardest and most brittle areas of both swords, and they will, will break. Occasionally, of course, in wild combat, there are going to be nicks. And it's interesting, if you've handled enough sword, a nick from an edge parry versus a nick that comes from just incidental combat is quite different. And you can see these without getting into all those things. That could be a, a video on its own. Um, that's why we're not doing that. Now here, an adaptation is this undulating I get close enough to get the light on there, you can see just right on the edge, you see these sort of waves. Hopefully you're seeing that okay. Um, those waves, ah, you can see it right in there pretty well. That means, that helps to mean that if a crack happens, it doesn't travel along the blade. If you have a very straight hardened edge, that's possible. So that would happen, that would cause that a little chip to be controlled and just be in that sort of tooth or wave shape. So that's why you have that. So that's really quite a nice, really quite nice. And I would say this is a very standard, for the blade form is a very standard uh, early Qing style of blade. And one reason I'm saying that is, you'll notice here, this is a Yan Mao Dao, by the way, I should say Yan Mao Dao. It's really straight. It's slightly, it wouldn't even say double-edged, it's beveled. 
from here to here. And this is, I've seen many, many antique blades just like this. This is, this would be like an off the rack, good quality Dao during the Qing period. You're going for a standard military blade. This is exactly it. And I've, I've seen countless blades like this, mounted and unmounted. The way you know that it's, that it's Qing and the period it's from is this shape here. Here at the very tip, you won't be able to probably see this on camera, it's not beveled until here. That keeps the tip stronger. This beveling here doesn't raise. On the earlier ones, there was a raised Yelman. It would come up and there'd be a, there'd be a sharp angle here and it would angle down. There would be a raised, that, that double-edged area. That raised Yelman was a feature that was adopted onto Japanese swords, excuse me, Japanese, what am I saying? Onto Chinese swords uh, from Islamic uh, sources. That creates a stress riser. And they realize that blades are breaking there. And so this is the, the evolution, the adaptation, the Qing adaptation. So really nice and good, I would say, nice springy, nice springy temper. Um, I asked him, could I cut with him? He said, no. <laughs> he wants not want to scratch him up. I understand. Okay, so that's the first one. Okay, let's look at the second one. John, I'll give you that one. So, I think these are all somewhat similar. So again, has, it comes in a nice box. And I'll just repeat, because uh, it's only fair to the, to the maker. Again, that nice white, if you're going out to a formal dinner, you have your white gloves. And, thank you, John. I'll give you that. That's the one for the other one. And, let's see. Again, the same thing, comes with a nice case, it's a, and it's a good quality case. It's not a flimsy fabric. Now, that's probably not the big deciding factor if you're thinking of getting a sword, but, but it's still nice to have. Okay, and got my scissors here. That come right off there. I'm going to make a mess here in the Wuguan. Oops. And okay, oh, this one has a lacquered scabbard. So that last one, I have to be very careful. This is where it's really good to have scissors instead of a knife because I've, I, I don't want to scratch that. We're good friends. He might not, we might not be good friends if I scratch his sword before he even gets it. So we don't want that to happen. But again, also, you, if you slip through the slip as you're doing it, you don't cut yourself with the knife using a pair of scissors. And these are pretty damn sharp scissors anyway. If you're ever in Japan, there's a nice Japanese scissors, same kind of use in China. If you go in the airport, you know, there's no weapon sign, includes no scissors because they're really rather sharp. You wouldn't really want somebody to have these on a plane. They are definitely, could be useful as a weapon. Okay, let's see if we get this all off now. Okay. All right, oh, so that's, ooh, very nice, lacquer. Uh, again, and you know, this squared style, the other last one we looked at was what's called a function or square style. This is also square style. This is generally more popular early on during the Ming and early Qing. This is a popular style compared to the uh, rounded. So you'll see um, many swords in the Qing period have a rounded shape and a round pommel. And that, is, that was, came popular later on. They existed earlier, but just fashion. Fashions change and square was more popular earlier. Later on was rounded. So very nice. Lacquer is very nicely done. And you see it's not a very thick scabbard. It's not overdone. A lot of times people overbuild things. It's usually if their skills aren't so good. But this looks like it's really nice and tight. Yeah, it look, looks really quite nice. And a very nice plane. I like things like this too. This plane, there's no decoration, so it's a real straightforward user. Look good, looks good. Looks very nice. And again, of course, has the tassel. And remember, I'm going to push the scabbard away rather than pull because it may be fitting tight, 
you know, maybe too much grease or something in there and I don't want to cut myself. So I'm going to push that away. Stuck a little bit at first. And John, I'll give you that. Just so I don't want to scratch that. And okay. Let me get this. Again, this is one thing I hope that they, all of the Smiths, as far as I know, are doing this in China. And I wish they would stop uh, because it's just more plastic garbage in the world. So guys that uh, fire and iron, if you're watching this, just give it a really good oil. It's okay without it. Really good oiling, a little bit of packing grease, it's gonna be fine. You've you're got the box well sealed, so you don't need that extra plastic. Okay, so this is the same, same kind of blade. So this one seems a little more curved than the last one. Um, one of the defining characteristics of a goose quill is that when you thrust with it, you can do it with my left hand here so maybe you can see better, the tip is in line to, for the thrust. So if it gets a little bit more curved, see this one's pretty much about, it goes a little bit further and this would be hard to really thrust with this because the tip would be upward. So if you can still thrust, that's a Yan Mao Dao or a Yan Ling Dao, and there's a variant you can call it the uh, Yuto, uh, fish head saber, Yuto Dao. And this one is a nice twist core. So we'll see if I can get that to show up on screen here in the lights. So this is essentially very, you know, the same sword as the previous one, but with a different uh, steel. And Chinese did twist core. I'll get the light on there. It's really tricky to do this. Pull out my chair a little bit. Uh, boom, 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 boom. This is going to be quite hard to catch. Ah, there you can see a little bit there. Very active in this, in this region, you can see. Hopefully that's coming through okay. Right, and this is, it's really well done. This is a good heavy stout one. This one's a little heavier than the last one. And uh, definitely they were heavier swords earlier on. When there's more armored combat, they tend to be heavier. Can be a kilo, can be a little bit more than a kilo. Um, take a real quick, let's take a look. I don't have my scale handy, but I can give you an idea of the measurements. The other thing is generally speaking, because this Yan Mao Dao, this is a 30 and a quarter inches, so that's 77 uh, centimeters. The um, Yan Mao Dao, because it's a hybridized weapon, the Yan Mao Dao is kind of has this double-edged area, so I can use the techniques of Jian. So I can use a Chao, for example. You can get the thrust. That's the whole idea of this Yan Mao Dao, that it's sort of a cross between a Jian and a uh, willow leaf. It's a straightened out willow leaf, you could say. It still has a bit of curvature, so it still cuts really well. And also because it's not beveled to both edges, it's only beveled, of course, to the one edge, the spine is quite thick, and so it delivers a lot more robust cut than a gen of the same, generally speaking, a gen of the same length. So this kind of sword is, uh, I, I like it a lot, this kind of uh, Dao, that's why in the academy, in our Dao Fa classes, I'm going to do a whole kind of series here with hybridizing our Dao Fa. So we're going to use, and I'm going to be using a goose quill like this for those classes because we're going to look at ways we can take some Gen Fa, slightly modify it and use it with the Dao. And that's exactly what this sword was really about. So it's this really hybrid model uh, of, you know, mixing, bringing, you know, just enough of a Gen flavor into this, just this, you know, about, oh, or does that be about six, seven inches that you can use those techniques, some techniques from Jen, backside cuts, but still have the power that you have with a dowel. So that's quite a nice one. Plain fittings, I believe those are iron. Uh, quite nice, quite nice overall. Okay, I passed that one off to John. And we got one more. It's like Christmas. <laughs> Christmas for sword bums. Okay, not more time. Let's see what this one is. I believe this is similar. We'll find out. Those two really varied by um, the most big difference between those last two was that they were different types of uh, steel. One had the horse tooth and one had the, the uh, twist core. I should also say, perhaps while I'm unwrapping this one, thank you, John that um, <clears throat> Tuscor is 
of no uh, added benefit as far as structure or anything like that goes. It's just more expensive to make. It looks really nice, uh, but functionally, it doesn't add anything to a sword. So that is definitely, if you see one, they're extremely expensive these days. We're talking uh, expensive, we're talking at least five figures to buy an antique one these days, and high five figures. So they're really, uh, they're fairly rare. They would absolutely have been the sort of somebody with of real means, you know. It's sort of, sometimes I say it's sort of like, you know, a Subaru or a Ferrari can both be driven to work. Get you to work on time through traffic at exactly the same, uh, you know, speed pretty much on a, on a, when you're in traffic. But one costs a lot more. So there's no, if you're commuting to work, there's no reason to be sitting in a Porsche or, you know, a high-end whatever car unless you want to, unless you want to spend the money on it. It's the same with swords. These swords that are fancier steel was just a way to show off your wealth. They're beautiful. They look nice to show off your wealth. They don't add anything to the functionality of the sword. The horse tooth, you can argue, does. Horse tooth was also more expensive because it's more time consuming to make. So that would have also been a more high end, more expensive sword. It is today still, if you get a smith to make you one. Okay. Uh, and this one looks to have the same sort of fittings as the last, yes. Okay, same kind of fittings. Bump, bump, bump. All right. We're really gonna have a mess to clean up after, after this. <laughs> Okay. Now here's, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier maybe. Um, <clears throat> I like that they give you a hanger because it's, you know, it's nice. I know most people are not walking around town with their sword, but it's a nice kind of thing. These, uh, everybody seems to use this. I don't know who came up, I think Quano came up with the design first, but it's become a very standard kind of hook that you see uh, everybody has. And a nice thing with this little peak, this is not, traditional at all, it would usually be just to be a ring. Uh, that's great if you just put a little nail in the wall to hang it there right away like this. So that's really nice kind of feature that I think most people are doing. Most of the forges have something similar to this if they're not copying each other. And that's, that's nice, it's very useful. Um, by the way, talking about displaying, Chinese swords are displayed in the rack this way. When people do this, mm, honestly, sometimes I find it a little bit irritating. This is how katana are put on a rack. This is not how Chinese swords are. Even in Japan, tachi are put in the rack this way. So please people, you know, let's use a culturally appropriate thing. If you wanna have a modern rack, whatever, we wanna display it somewhere, fine. But if you're putting it in a proper rack in your wuguan or someplace in your home, this is the way that Chinese swords are racked, okay? So uh, here, again, we have the, the thing. And I should say, when we look at this carefully before, the wraps look really, that's really, that's a very good, very solid grip wrap. That's really nice. That's good. And again, very simple, very simple fittings. I can't tell if these are steel. They've been blackened, so I'm not sure if they're steel or if they're brass. Either one would be good. And once again, ah, this one. Ah, so this one, Johnny, if you would, please. This one is a um, little bit lighter than the last one, which is really nice. I mean, if you have the funds, uh, it's nice to have two swords because some days, I mean, like honestly, if I've come back from when I was traveling a lot, you know, pre-pandemic, I was going 85, almost 86,000 miles every year. If I come back from, you know, a couple weeks teaching overseas, I don't always want to pick out my heaviest sword. I have a short swords that I train with, you know, because I want to train, but I maybe sometimes it's just arm needs a break. It's okay, right? It needs a break. So it's this one, I can feel right away. It's definitely a bit lighter. That same, so it's the same sword as the last one. So it's the same, same exact thing, but it's a little bit lighter, which is nice to have. So, uh, one is for training, I think in this case he has one for keeping and one for training, <laughs> I think that's the plan. Um, this one being a little lighter, 
depending on how you're feeling one day or another, if you've been working out really hard, it's winter, you've been shoveling snow, nice to have the lighter one to train with. Otherwise, this one is the same thing. Same Yamal Dao. Get that, oh, yeah, get the light on there. You see that? Get the light to play across this tip area. So from here to here is beveled. So this is not sharp. It's dull. I mean, I can, I'm not going to do that on this edge. This is, yeah, that's plenty sharp. Uh, but here I can push hard. It's okay. And that's the way they work. I've handled, like I said, I've handled many period examples, both mounted and unmounted blades. And that's never on the Qing period ones. That's never really sharp, sharp. And also it, it's a bulge here. It's kind of a sort of a diamond shape. So it's another thing that's different with the Qing era, Yan Mao Dao versus the Ming is because that double edge doesn't come all the way to the tip. The tip is stronger. It's reinforced by that thickness here that only starts to bevel from this point and then down to there. And by the way, normally you shouldn't really be touching blades. I got a lot of oil on my hands from having unwrapped them as a sink, so I'm not worried about it. And there's still a lot on the blade, but I will clean the blade afterwards to make sure that I don't have anything, salts or anything from my hand that will damage the, you know, mar the blade. And, and once again, this one is, see if I can get a little closer and see if I can, uh, play on the light. Yeah, you can kind of see maybe up in here. See how that is? A twist core blade. I get the, ah, there you go. Kind of see it in here a little bit. And over time, uh, I can see it now with the naked eye. I've got good light here in the Wuga. I know it probably has come across well on video, but over time, yeah, that, will, that will slowly come out a little bit more. And the Chinese used to do some etching. You could use, uh, there's acids you can use, but you can even use lemon oil or, or lemon juice, I should say. And, uh, wipe off the blade, use some alcohol, try to strip off the oil, and you can bring out that pattern a little bit more. So, uh, but over time, it will slowly come out, and that's usually how I leave it, just let it come out over time. Okay, so there you have it. Three Yan Mao Dao or Yan Ling Dao. I think more in manu old manuals and things, you see Yan Mao Dao, but also called Yan Ling Dao. Uh, it's also a proper name for these. Uh, all from the art of fire and iron. Decent forge, good quality blade. Let's see how the temper is here. Uh, interesting. So this one is a little, little bit, little bit tighter, but that's just the edge. That's the geometry of the sword. That's, I don't think that's the heat treating. It could just be a little bit thicker, a little bit different in the fullers. When I hit it, I could feel this vibration in my hand, like a, like a tuning fork, which is nice. I'm just hitting here. Okay. And the other one was a little bit more. Uh, a little larger oscillation, you could say. But both were exactly as I've seen antique sorts.